third seminar of this Monday of Cultural History. This seminar is organized by the universities of Pisa and Venice in collaboration with the Center for Cultural History. This afternoon, this afternoon we are very pleased and honored to have with us Professor Thomas Dixon, who is Professor of History at Queen Mary University of London. Is an historian of philosophy, science, medicine, and religion with a particular expertise in the history of emotions and in Victoria intellectual and cultural history. He has worked on different aspects of the history of emotions, including the transition from patience to emotions in English langu language thought, in, on the meaning of altruism in 19th century ethics, and the history of tears and weeping and in the history of anger. is a member of the Queen Mary Center for the History of Emotions, and since 2015 is the principal investigator of a Welcome Trust grant entitled Living with Feeling, Emotional Health in History, Philosophy, and Experience. Among his publication, I'm just going to remember Weeping Britannia, Portrait of a Nation in Tears, published in 2015 by Oxford University Press, and The Invention of Altruism, Making Moral Meanings in Victorian Britain, published in 20, uh, 2008 by Oxford University Press. Uh, Professor Dixon is co-editor with Jewel Evans of the History of Emotions blog, and is also co-editor with Ute Frevert of the Oxford University Press book series, Emotions in History. He has worked for BBC Radio and has developed a program of lessons about emotions to use in primary schools. In 2019, he presented his research in a podcast series titled The Sound of Anger, which won two gold awards at the British Podcast Awards of 2020. And he's currently writing a, an introductory book on the history of emotions for Oxford, for Oxford University Press. So two practical, practical instructions before giving the floor to Professor Dixon. The seminar is going to be recorded and available on Facebook and YouTube. And if for the Q&A session uh, taking place after the talk, you can make a reservation in the chat. So we're very honored to give the floor now to uh, Thomas Dixon. The title of his lecture is From Patience to Emoji. Words, Images, and Ideas in the History of Emotions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena and Ignacio and Carlotta for inviting me and for having me in your seminar. It's a great pleasure to be here um, while um, also being in Kent, uh, in England, and, and being able to see all of these people in, around Europe. It's, it's a great honour to be in your seminar. Thank you very much. I assume everyone can hear me. Can you just nod? Can you yeah, all okay. Um, please do, you know, people wave your hands or, or shout or do the online equivalent if anything goes wrong with my presentation, because I probably won't know <laughs> uh, until, until it does. Um, so I'm going to share my screen because I have um, a PowerPoint presentation to share. Is that okay? People see that? Okay. I'm going to assume everything's going okay uh, until someone uh, shouts at me. Okay. Um, so my talk is called From Passions to Emojis, Words, Images and Ideas in the History of Emotions. And I, this is a cultural history seminar. So I'm wanting, I'm wanting to give a talk, assuming that I'm speaking to fellow historians mainly um, and people who know a bit about the history of emotions. Um, but hopefully there'll be something that will be new for some people and, and lots of it might be new for, for, for others. So this... this uh, title in this very first slide, I'm, I'm doing something slightly simplistic on purpose, which is putting next to each other a 17th century image of the passions um, and a 21st century image, which is taken from the Emoji movie. Um, and one very simplistic interpretation would be, this is basically the same things. Uh, this is the emotions, and they're just represented in a kind of quaint 17th century way versus a modern 21st century way. Now, obviously, none of you will think that that is a, um, a, a good or sophisticated interpretation, but this is the starting point, and I want to explore what's wrong with that assumption that this is the same thing and what a historian of emotions might say about it. Okay. 
Uh, my talk has four parts, and I'll talk for about 10 minutes on each of these four parts. I think it's you know helpful to try and uh, to guide people on a map through what I'm saying. Uh, so the first part is called A Thing Nowhere to Be Laid Hands On. And part two is called The Use of Passions, which is where that 1649 image comes from. Third, Imagining Ire, that comes from my research on anger, and it's particularly about images of rage and ire. And fourthly, the use of emojis, coming up to the present and asking what can we learn from the historical story about what we think in the present. So first of all, a thing nowhere to be laid hands on. This first section comes from the first chapter of my introductory book about the history of emotions I'm currently working on. This is the first, first time I've used some of this material uh, for an introduction to a talk. Um, although if anyone's seen me give a talk before, they almost certainly will have seen me quote from this text because this is one of my uh, go-to quotes uh, about the history of emotions. So it's from the 1837 History of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, the Scottish writer and historian. And this section is called The Gods Are a Thirst, and it's towards the end of his history of the French Revolution. And I'll read just a couple of sentences out, then talk about them. Carlyle asks his readers and himself, what then is this thing called La Révolution, which like an angel of death hangs over France, noyarding, fusillading, fighting, gun boring, tanning human skins? La Révolution is but so many alphabetic letters, a thing nowhere to be laid hands on, to be clapped under lock and key. Where is it? What is it? It is the madness that dwells in the hearts of men. In this man it is, and in that man, as a rage or as a terror, it is in all men. Now, the reason I love this uh, quotation is um, the way it captures what I feel like I'm doing when I'm writing the history of emotions, which is... Um, uh, I sorry, I need to fiddle a bit with the screen to read my own quote, um, which is trying to find the invisible uh, and the intangible through words in historical records. Um, so I'm quoting myself here. This is me, but I'm just going to read it out. Um, For the most part, historians encounter the passions and feelings of the past in the form of words. These might be words written in the heat of passion in a love letter, words printed in a medical treatise about diseases of the mind, words published in a newspaper report of a sensational trial, or words in the lyrics of a song. But very often what the historian of emotion starts with is indeed but so many alphabetic letters, as Carlyle puts it. Emotions can seem as if they are nowhere to be laid hands on even when they have left their traces in documents, in treasured objects or physical locations. Careful, historically informed reading of these visible outward signs of inward, invisible feelings is the central work of historians of emotions. So that is my gloss, my interpretation of Carlyle. Another inspiring figure for historians of emotions is Lucien Fèvre, probably the person most often credited with inventing the history of emotions in a couple of essays in the 1930s and 40s. In 1941, Ferre wrote an essay called Sensibility and History, How to Reconstitute the Effective Life of the Past. And amongst the famous quotes, he, he says, I'm asking for a vast collective investigation to be opened on the fundamental sentiments of man and the forms they take. What surprises we may look forward to. Um, and in the last 20 years, especially, we've been having lots of those surprises, um, discovering a lot about the history of emotions. And I wanted to draw attention to the fact that he lists conduct books, novels and court records on the one hand, but also paintings, sculpture and music on the other. So he's looking at words and also imagery and other forms of expression and um, uh, interpretation through the arts. Fevre also said that the science of contemporary psychologists can have no possible application to the past. Psychological anachronism is the worst sort of anachronism and the most insidious and harmful of all. The reason I emphasize that, which may be slightly overstated, um, it may be slightly overstated to say the science of psychology of today can have no application to the past, but I would certainly agree it can't be simply applied to the past. Um, and the reason I emphasize that in this talk is that when we're thinking about words, as well as images, it's very important to understand that words, even the exact same words that we use today, 
had different meanings in the past. But certainly for a lot of the time, history of emotions is about translating words, translating words across cultures, across languages and across time. Um, and we should not assume that we know the correct translation or that translation is easy. Okay, so that brings us to the, uh, to the second uh, part and the first sort of main part of this talk, um, which is about the use of passions. Um, forgive me, I'm actually fighting with a cat at the same time. Uh, obviously, as always happens with Zoom, is trying to get in on the action. Okay, so I'll slow down now slightly and talk about this one particular text and image for, for a few minutes. This uh, work was first written in French in 1641 by the philosopher Sonneau, uh, De l'usage des passions. Um, it's translated into English in 1649 by Henry, Earl of Monmouth, as the use of passions. This is not an important point, but I don't know why the definite article was dropped in the English translation. The French title is the use of the passions, which would make sense in English as well. So I don't know why the the disappears. It becomes the use of passions. Um, the image on the left, the frontispiece, is produced by an artist called William Marshall. Um, and I'll say a little bit of, about that um, in just a second. Uh, and I've included just the, the final page of the text there as well for people uh, to see. Um, and its conclusion is that from all these discourses, it's easy to gather that there is no passion in our soul which may not be profitably husbanded by reason and by grace. I won't read more of that out now, but um, I'll explain a bit more about what Sano uh, was, was all about. So this... Uh, text is unsurprisingly a Christian work of moral philosophy about the passions of the soul. It's underpinned by Augustinian views of the self as a kind of battleground. The whole picture is one of conflict. It's a battleground between earthly and heavenly loves, between the passions and reason, the passions and grace. And it's translated into English by the royalist Henry Earl of Monmouth in 1649. And the text I mean, Monmouth's main contribution is to translate it into English, but he does also include some verses and a short introductory letter to the reader um, at the beginning. And he uses those pages to give a kind of political, almost Machiavellian twist to the text. He says, if you want to govern, your, if you want to govern others, you need to learn to govern your own passions. And so he's saying, if you want to be a ruler, if you want to be powerful, you need to govern your own passions. And that's why you need this book. 1649 is the year that the king is executed in the English Civil War, so it's the peak of that conflict. Um, and Henry is a royalist who wants there to be strong rulers ruling their passions and ruling the people, a very obvious and famous parallel in political thought. The passions um, are depicted in this text as monsters, as wild beasts, as rebels. They need to be tamed, enslaved, Occasionally, um, the text goes further and says the passions need to be stifled, extinguished, basically killed. Um, and so there's a real tension in this work between this view of passions as dangerous and sinful rebels who need to be uh, stifled or tamed, but also the idea which I read out briefly from the previous slide, which is that um, passions can be redeemed. They can be consecrated to God and they can have a proper use. And the uses of the passions are various. For example, um, anger or choler can be turned inwards against one's own sinful self. Grief and sorrow are useful because they lead us to repent for our mistakes and our errors uh, and so on. So to give a little bit more context to the, the image of the passions as well as to the text, it was made by William Marshall who also made this famous image, the Icon Basilicae in 1649, the same year, um, a very popular book, which was published a few days after the execution of Charles I. Um, it claimed to record the meditations and prayers of the king himself. Um, and as you can maybe see from the slide, um, Charles is depicted as a Christ-like man of sorrows. You may not be able to see, but he is, he's weeping, there are tears um, on his cheeks. Um, and he is a tearful kind of martyr and king. And this image becomes a rallying point for royalists. So this is one kind of emotional image of power, is the weeping and soon-to-be martyr King Charles. And the same artist in the same year produces uh, this frontispiece for the use of the passions. 
there were 11 passions that is following the exact same model as Thomas Aquinas and many other writers in the 17th century. There are five pairs of passions, including uh, love and hate, hope and despair. I won't go through all of them. Uh, and then the one that doesn't have an opposite is choler or anger. Um, so choler, as it's depicted here, is the one with no opposite. The imagery here is quite complex. They're all chained together, which is representing slavery. Uh, so it's partly representing that humans can become slaves to their passions and that slavery can be a kind of punishment for sinful humans. But also the passions, as it says in the first line of text at the bottom, are arraigned by reason. So they are controlled and held in chains by the female figure of reason sitting on the throne. And reason in turn is being advised by divine grace. So in theory, this is what should happen. The passions are there. They are troublesome. They are a problem. They are rebellious, but they are in chains and being controlled by reason and grace. So that is a conflictual picture and not an easy one, but it's in a way an ideal um, of what might happen. And one of the ways that this Christian view of the passions is different from, let's say, a classical Stoic view is that the ideal does include all these passions. They, they just need to be used in the right way, but they're not to be got rid of. Um, the ideal Christian for Sano and Monmouth is not a Stoic sage. It is someone who has passions but uses them the right way. Um, I'm, I'm just zooming in a little bit closer and looking at some of the details. Um, here there are two passions I'm particularly interested in, sorrow and choler. Um, and what I've just done uh, is, is really exactly what I want to suggest we should not do, which is I've taken away more and more and more context until we're looking at a picture that looks quite familiar and modern, someone crying and someone is angry. So what I've just done there is what I think historians shouldn't do. <laughs> um, it's to take away the difficult theological text, take away the weird imagery, <laughs> um, and, and to show something that looks quite modern. So my sort of punchline for this section is, this is not an emotion, okay? Don't be fooled. <laughs> Um, and I'll expand just very slightly on some of the reasons that I say that. Um, firstly, it's just to echo what Lucien Fevre says, psychological anachronism is the worst sort of anachronism. They are passions, so let's call them passions, and let's, as historians, try and understand what that means. Uh, and for a lot of texts in Europe, in the medieval and early modern period, it'll mean something like what I've just explained uh, for Sano, but with lots of variations, obviously. So the passions are not the emotions. And to try to access the invisible realities behind this image, the historian needs to understand the verbal and visual languages in which it is expressed, and in order to, and to, to, and in order to access the ideas and social context which in which those passions were felt and used. Uh, and so in this very brief section, I've suggested you might start doing that by looking at the history of William Marshall and his artwork. What, what is the political and religious meaning of the, the visual symbolism about passion? But also we need to understand Christian theology. We need to understand 17th century politics, the English Civil War, the French uh, wars of religion, we need to understand what it would mean to talk about slavery in the 17th century uh, and the ideas of punishment and, and power that are wrapped up in that. And I'm just sharing here one quotation about slavery in particular, because I think it's quite an interesting image. Um, and here, uh, Suno is saying that um, God uses the passions um, as, as punishments. And he, so talking about the passions, he says, for they become chains, he's talking to God here, for they become chains in thy hands to bind these malefactors with. Thou forgest out of them irons to punish these slaves, and thou changest their desires into aversions and their pleasures into pain. Thou abandonest every sinner to the passion which possesses him. So the passions are a punishment. It's a bit like virtue being its own reward. Passion is its own punishment. And the slavery and the chains of passion symbolize that punishment. Uh, and I just 
wanted, because of this slavery image and because this book has just come out, to mention this interesting book, um, She is Weeping, an intellectual history of racialized slavery and emotions in the Atlantic world, um, which, as I said, just come out this year by Danelle Gutara Cordero. And she looks across a very wide spectrum from ancient um, to modern, at the idea of slavery of the passions. Um, and I guess there are two ideas that go together in her book. One is the idea that slaves and people of uh, non-white races are described as being over-emotional, both over-emotional and under-emotional, actually. They're both not emotional enough and too emotional. But also going woven into that, um, the history of the idea of the slavery to passions and how that image is used in the history of ideas. Okay, to, 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 to end my comments on Sano, I just wanted to recommend a few things you might read if you wanted to know more about Sano and his philosophy of the passions and where that fits in the 17th century. Um, one of my former students, Richard Firth, God be here, wrote his thesis uh, on naming and understanding the opposites of desire, a prehistory of disgust. Uh, and there's a lot in there on Sano and Monmouth's translation. Anthony Levy uh, in the 1960s wrote a book, French Moralist, The Theory of the Passions, which is another good place to try and understand the, the deeper philosophy of this. Susan James's book on passion and action in the 17th century, um, and Erin Sullivan's book on sadness in the 17th century. All of those have things to say that would shed some more light on this particular emotional moment. And I want to end this section with another very simple, simple point and one that I have made repeatedly throughout my career over and over again uh, for 20 years and is the origin of the title of this talk. Um, so this talk is called From Passions to Emojis, which is a slight play on the title of my book, which is From Passions to Emotions. Um, and just in case anyone's not heard me say this before, um, a very significant change happens in 19th century English language psychology, where the emotions come into existence as a psychological category for the first time. And one of my suggestions is that when that happens, there are some distinctions between appetites, passions, affections, and sentiments that get lost under this big umbrella of emotions. But something else that's relevant here is that the emotions, if you like, are depathologized. The passions are a big moral, and spiritual uh, problem. They are a source of conflict, pain, and mental and moral disease. The emotions are sometimes those things for some thinkers, but by and large, the emotions are taken out of that moral and theological context and are something quite, their meaning is something quite different for that reason. Um, if you want to read more about that, there's my book. And there is a short article making many of the same points, which is open access, emotion, the history of a keyword in crisis, and that's only six pages long. So I can highly recommend that for busy scholars wanting a quick uh, summary. I also need to say that since my uh, book came out uh, almost 20 years ago, lots of other scholars have done lots of much more sophisticated work on this topic. Um, and there's some really interesting things you can read questioning to some extent what I say in my book and maybe giving a slightly more complex picture about the languages of feeling and affect in the 16th and 17th centuries. There's an article here by Kirk Essery and there's an edited book there which is really great, uh, The Language of Feeling Before Emotion, uh, which a lot of different takes, if, especially if you're interested in the history of ideas in the medieval period uh, and going into the early modern. Okay. So that's one way of thinking about passions. And I've really tried to emphasize the moral and theological context, which I think is so important. And the reason I keep on banging on about it is I still to this day find that I'm reading stuff uh, in the, especially the early modern period. And I feel like we need more theology to, to understand what these passions were doing for people. Okay, I'm now going to look at a very particular story. And this is part of the story of the, the prehistory, shall we say, of anger. And I want to look at era. Uh, we saw in the image on the frontispiece of the use of the passions, there was collar. Uh, era is a related idea, so is anger. Um, and I'm just going to say one brief word about the language in English of angry feelings. Um, but then I'm going to 
move on to images. Okay. This uh, Google Ngrams graph uh, shows the relative frequency of certain English words uh, from 1750 to more or less the present. And what I did was to type in uh, rage, resentment, fury, wrath, anger, a range of different English words in the family of angry vocabulary and look at their frequency across the sort of millions of pages of books that are in Google Books in English. And the picture that emerges, roughly speaking, is that everything apart from anger is, is used quite heavily in the 18th century. Resentment and rage are the most frequently used. The 19th century, we have this sort of turning point, this crossing over. Um, and then gradually, anger comes to dominate this semantic field. And then in the last, um, I'm sorry, I have to keep on fiddling with Zoom because I'm in front of the, 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 the image I need to see. Um, the last 20 years or so, or 40 years possibly, um, anger really massively comes to dominate. And so without going into any more detail or depth, it suggests a picture in which sort of the emotional field of rage and wrath and anger has been become dominated in, in, in modern, very modern times by the single English language word anger. So that's one part of the picture I think is interesting and I think is important to, to remember. Um, but what, as I say, what I want to talk about most of the next few minutes is imagery, uh, images. So I've talked about words a bit and now I'm talking about images for a bit. But you'll see I'm making some similar points. So here we have, um, from around 1500, the seven deadly sins and four last things, a tabletop painting by Hieronymus Bosch and or his workshop circa 1500. Um, this is an amazing, uh, colourful, narrative really of sin and sinfulness and a kind of everyday set of moral stories for people. Um, I'll zoom in on ira, rage or wrath, it's normally translated. I would strongly recommend against translating it as anger. Um, and it's a picture that shows what may be in many, many uh, parts of history, a familiar scene, two men who seem to be drunk outside a pub having a fight. Uh, one of them has been attacked with a piece of furniture, which he's wearing on his head. The other one is carrying a sword or a knife and um, a woman is trying to restrain him. So that is era. It's a story of male drunken violence um, with a woman trying to restrain one of the men. I'm going to show just an, another couple of different images of era as one of the seven deadly sins. If there are any Peter Bruegel experts here, I'd love to hear their attempt to interpret this. I'm not going to try. <laughs> um, it's an incredibly elaborate sort of allegor allegorical image of, of sin and violence. Um, and I'm using it really rather superficially, just as an example of the complexity of imagery that you might get when someone was trying to show what is era um, in the 16th century. And there are other ways to get at related ideas. So this one is about collar. So remember that the, the word collar was used by Monmouth in his translation. Well, this is an emblem of collar from a similar period in the 17th century. And it's a man, a young man with a sword. So again, we have a man with a sword, but he doesn't look at all drunk or irate, he's rather serene, and, and there's a lion there to symbolize a, a sort of courage, a sternness, uh, perhaps a, a threat of violence as well. So that's a, a different way to visualize collar as, as a, a, a passion of sort of courage and aggression. Uh, and then there is, th th there is a theme in the history of art of showing era visually as hot-headed violence. Um, so this is a portrait, sorry, not a portrait, this is an image from the 1620s um, of era. It's the man with a sword in a tavern, uh, knocking over a drink, knocking over a table, uh, and probably he's just heard an insult or something that he doesn't like, and his eyes are flashing. But again, I guess my point I want to make here is it's the whole story that we're looking at. We're looking at a scenario and a story to represent the sin of era. I didn't want to end this section without talking about Leonardo. Um, in his treatise on painting, in his notebooks, um, Leonardo devotes a paragraph to telling painters how to depict una figura irata, an irate figure. Um, and it follows in this same moralistic tradition that I'm talking about. Um, the enraged man should be shown holding another man down on the ground, 
by the hair of his twisted head, his knees on the other man's ribs and his right arm raising his fist on high. And he specifies that the irate man's hair should stand on end, his teeth should be clenched and his neck should be swollen. So actually, we've got a bit of physiognomy here as well as a bit of the kind of moral violence scenario uh, going on. Um, so in this sweeping history, I want to suggest a kind of moment of discontinuity um, in the 17th century. Uh, and the second half of the 17th century, uh, we get this modern Western fixation emerge on the human face as the most important signifier of feelings. Uh, the key figure here, as many of you will know, is the French painter Charles Lebrun, who directed art and artistic education in the court of uh, Louis XIV. And he is the pioneer of the modern project of matching words with faces, yeah? not words with complex allegories, not words with stories or scenarios, words with a human face. All the context taken out. Remember the beginning I said, don't do what I've done to that image of, of sorrow and anger. Well, he is doing that. All the context goes. It's just about the face and the word. So here we have Lebrun uh, showing us la colère. Um, I wanted to point out that he doesn't have just one angry face, you know, so he's not a basic emotions theorist. There's not just anger. That's colère, there's jalousie, désespoir. Um, there's others as well uh, uh, of these related field of passions with different faces. Having said that, his image of la colère does come to dominate as a representation of rage and ire uh, in the 17th, 18th, and even into the 19th century. The image on the right is taken from the work of Charles Bell, the Scottish uh, physician, um, neurologist. Charles Bell's an incredibly important figure in the history of neurology and the discovery of the nerves, the nervous system. But he also wrote an important treatise on the expression of the emotions, uh, the anatomy of, of expression, he called it. What I wanted to point out was that Charles Bell's image in 1844 is quite similar to Charles Lebrun. But the other thing I wanted to point out is that it's more or less physically impossible to make this face. Uh, I, I don't think I'll try and do it now, especially since this is being recorded and streamed on Facebook, but um, you need to have your lips together in the middle, open on both sides and turned down. You need your eyes to be bulging out, but also you need to be frowning. Um, and this is a, it's, it's a serious point, which is that the standard image of la colère on the face was impossible to do. Well, no, I shouldn't be anachronistic. It's impossible for me to do. And most people I've asked to try and do it can't do it. Um, and I think that is actually uh, a serious point about the decontextualized project of matching basic emotion words with faces. It's completely unnaturalistic. It's so miles away from naturalistic human experience. And I guess what I'm saying here is it always has been um, from Lebrun uh, onwards. Uh, we then have Darwin. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this, but very happy to answer questions about, but just I'm sort of zooming through the, the, the visual history after Charles Bell. And actually Darwin, you won't be surprised to hear, has some more interesting and original uh, things to say about it. He doesn't use that stereotypical anger face at all. Here we've got a snarling dog and a snarling woman, uh, and he, he's making points about the mouth and the teeth. Um, here we have, again, it's some different faces. The one on the left is indignation. So the guy in the amazing velvet dressing gown is showing indignation. So a, a, a sort of type of anger, but not, not, not a sort of stereotypical one. I mean, it's a very Victorian type of anger uh, and it's fitting in, with Darwin's uh, time. Then we get to the basic emotions paradigm of Paul Ekman, uh, and these images are from his work in the 1970s. And that paradigm takes us right up to the present uh, in terms of one way of thinking scientifically about the expression of the emotions. I want to point out here that the whole theory of basic emotions should mean that each basic emotion has one facial expression. However, there's never been just one anger expression. Um, even here we can see in these two images, there's one with the tightly closed mouth and one with the showing the teeth. Um, in some, the eyes are quite closed, in others, the eyes are quite open. 
And this image illustrates that contrast again. These are two quite different faces, which are both allegedly expressing the single basic emotion of anger. Um, a more complex, more interesting way of looking about this, which is the last thing I will say in this section, uh, is uh, to think about the angry young man in Indian cinema. Uh, and this is what this image shows, uh, a famous Bollywood actor, uh, Amitabh Bakalan in um, An Angry Young Man film in the 1970s. And this is interesting in thinking about words and images because it brings together an English language phrase, angry young man, with a whole um, Indian tradition of visual representation uh, in a new way. So there are there are ways of bringing together words and images which can do something new and create a new uh, kind of stereotype and a new paradigm for anger. And that's what this did in the 1970s. Um, I don't have time to go into this. I can talk about Raza theory in ancient Indian tradition if people would like to have more of a discussion about that. Um, the only thing I want to emphasize again is that Raza theory, which is about the emotional tone of performers and their bodies and their faces, is not something that can be easily translated into basic emotions. It's a whole different um, way of thinking about feeling and performance. Um, but it's interesting that it can get attached to a phrase like angry young man. And what I want to recommend on this is that you go and read Imka Rajamani's work, um, including this article, Pictures, Emotions, Conceptual Change, Anger in Popular Hindi Cinema, which is a really original article looking at how to think about that combination that I've just rather clumsily tried to explain of words and images coming together to make what Rajamani describes as a sort of visual concept. So it's prioritizing imagery, and but still trying to think of it as a concept, an emotion concept that people can use. Okay. And again, if you want a slightly, uh, slightly more careful and detailed account of the, the history that I'm telling here. I have an article called What is the History of Anger? A History of, which includes this section about imagery, but also gets into much more depth on the words and ideas too. So racing through all of that, and it's outrageously a way I'm skipping over centuries and questions like this, but I guess when you're a professor, you can, you can take liberties like this. I hope so anyway. It brings me to the final section on uh, emojis. And I here want to talk about the present day. And I want to talk about, very briefly, some work that I've been doing in schools um, in England. Okay. So the first thing I want to point out is that not all cartoon versions of emotions are the same. Uh, so some of you may be aware of the movie Inside Out, um, which came out um, Disney Pixar in 2015. Um, and this is very closely based on Paul Ekman's theory of basic emotions. So that's Paul Ekman there uh, in the photograph. And there are the basic emotions, anger, disgust, joy, fear and sadness, um, running the brain of the character Riley in the movie Inside Out. Um, so this is the basic emotions theory I've already talked about, where all human beings in all times and places have the same number of emotions, and they all have these um, stereotyped expressions. You'll probably know if you, if you have an interest in the history of emotions, that this theory has been repeatedly and widely criticized and um, debunked, uh, including um, by psychologists working on facial expressions. Um, this is an article from uh, Science, published a few years ago. Uh, this is an article that's just out in 2021, which is a meta-analysis of whether emotions match up with their predicted facial expressions. And this meta-analysis suggests that no, they don't, and that the basic emotions model doesn't work. Um, and this is a more sort of a, a longer kind of essay in Eon magazine uh, called Feeling in Situ, which is a, a kind of accessible essay about the, the attack on the, the, the kind of Paul Ekman view of emotions. Uh, and that, again, was published recently. And you can so you can you know, publish in October and you can read more there about what's wrong with basic emotions. So that is one version of kind of cartoon uh, representations of emotions that, that, that children will learn their emotions from. 
So one thing that I'd love to hear what people think about in the questions and discussion is, as historians of emotions or as cultural critics today, what do we make of this juxtaposition here, learning about passions through the seven deadly sins uh, and learning about emotions from inside out? What's going on? Are, are, they, are they doing the same thing? What's different about those, um, those texts and those representations, those images? But also, as I said, wanted to point out there's more than one modern language of emotions. There's more than one sort of cartoony way of looking at emotions. And that's why I put emojis in my title. Because, of course, all of us or many of us now routinely express ourselves through emojis. Um, and these have some relationship to emotions. Uh, but it's not entirely clear what their relationship is. Emojis are somewhere between words and images, I would say. Um, and if there are any linguists here or indeed art historians or anybody else, I'm sure you would have ideas about whether emojis are a language, whether emojis are art. Um, I, I think it's true to say they're a lot more interesting than you know, the basic emotions in Inside Out in terms of figuring out what's going on, uh, in terms of change over time, which is what we're interested in as historians. And I want to end by talking about uh, what I spend a lot of my time doing at the moment, which is going into primary schools, um, by which I mean schools where the children are aged between about five years old and 11 years old, um, and introducing them to the history of emotions, introducing them to, I hope, interesting ways to think visually and verbally about emotions. Um, I can talk more about this in discussion if people want, but uh, I just wanted to share with you uh, some material that was generated by children in a school that I visited last week. So a few days ago, I was in a school and um, one of the things that I do is I get them all just to put their hands up and come up with as many different emotions as they can. Uh, and then their teacher writes them up on the board. And this is a list of emotions that the children came up with. There's loads of interesting things about this. They had amazing vocabulary, these children, overwhelmed, overjoyed, embarrassed, um, dumbstruck. Is that on there somewhere? That, uh, maybe at the bottom. One of them said dumbstruck. Um, but there are two words that I particularly noticed that came up that I've circled here. Winky and meh. <laughs> um, now those are emojis. I hadn't said anything about emojis. All I'd said was, please put up your hand and tell me names of emotions. And two of them, at least, gave me names of emojis. Um, and obviously, that's very interesting from the point of view of the history of emotions and the way that the words and images work together and they feed off each other. But not only that, the words and images and emotions work together uh, and feed off each other. We learn emotions through words and images and we learn words and images through emotions. And it's, you know, children learn all this stuff at the same time. They don't have an emotion and then find a word to put on it. You know, that people are using this word and then they try and figure out what is the scenario in which this word is being used. I could go on about that, but I won't. So it's a, it's, a, it's a massively dynamic process. And this is we're seeing it sort of live in action here. An emoji is becoming a word, is becoming an emotion. I also wanted to point out that in the, the emoji movie, I mean, the actual emoji movie from 2017 was probably a source here, I think, because meh is an important emoji in that movie. I also wanted just, mainly because I'm really fascinated by it myself and quite proud of the children of what they come up with wanted to share some other things that the same group of children came up with so another task that i give them is to i say please represent an emotion uh, using just color and shape so choose an emotion and draw it but i don't want to see a smiley face i want to see just shape and color all three of these images at the top um after the children have finished the images and held them up and we talked about them i said okay well, what was the emotion all three of these, they said, depressed. Not sadness, but depressed. And um, we had a good chat about that in the class. Um, the word depressed comes up a lot. And again, I think we can see here sort of emotional history in action. The medical category of depression is getting into everyday language more and more. Um, and we had a talk in the, in, in the class about the difference between blue and black as sort of types of feeling and types of depression. The other thing I'm, I've, I'm, I've got down here is um, a quote from one of the children about what is an emotion. And they said, uh, an emotion is how we feel and they are how we express ourselves. It also shows your opinion about something. Now, I have to say that absolutely blew my mind. Um, they just came up with this. An emotion is your opinion about something. I mean, that is the cognitive theory of emotions. That's, you know, one of the kind of major psychological theories of emotions. And so I was 
Uh, really interested and impressed to see they came up with that. Why am I telling you all that? Um, the reason I'm telling you that stuff about school is, is partly to say that the same questions that we want to ask about a text like The Use of the Passions, about how words and images and social contexts give rise to particular emotional regimes, we can ask still today. And again, we can have a back and forth between historical questions and our questions in the present. But I suppose I also wanted to say that uh, I'm sure it wouldn't apply to anybody here, but you sometimes hear people talking about emojis as if it's the end of the world, you know, <laughs> that, you know, the young people and children, oh, they express themselves in emojis as if that's a terrible thing to do. And it's very simplistic and it means they've lost touch with real life. They've lost touch with real emotions. And I just wanted to say, based on my experience of meeting with children, talking with children, hearing their ideas and so on, we don't need to worry about that. Emojis are very complex, actually, and they're part of a rich emotional life, which can be visually rich and verbally rich and and rich in ideas. Um, uh, and indeed, I think if we want to encourage a, a, a sort of diverse and pluralistic understanding of emotions, we should teach our kids emojis. And that's probably a good place to end. Um, so I've written this book called Weeping Britannia. If you'd like to know more about the history of tears and weeping in Britain, I'm currently writing The History of Emotions, a very short introduction. Um, my podcasts about anger have already been mentioned and are... Uh, full of interesting people other than me talking about it, anger. And there's two original dramas that we made as part of this podcast series, one called Seneca Annoyed and one called Darwin Vexed, which are very entertaining introductions to ideas. And there's some contact information. Phew. And that's probably enough from me. And I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me race through all those ideas. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this fascinating uh, <laughs> talk. And uh, if anyone has got a question, yeah. Or you can just uh, make a reservation in the chat and we will give you uh, the floor. Right. right. May I, Helena? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this rich and eclectic uh, presentation. Uh, we have a lot of stuff on the ground. Um, I have uh, just two questions um, about two topics which I didn't find in your, in your presentation, but I think it's, they are important in, in consideration and history of emotions. Uh, so between emotions and words or images, what is the, the role of uh, memory and communication? So there's two points which I would like to uh, ask you. Um, I mean, uh, if, if, we, if we think about images... Um, the great thesis of Abbe War Warburg was that pathos formal are mm, a matter of memory. No, so uh, in this process of uh, uh, passage between patience and emotions, how memory uh, 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 matter does matter. Uh, the second, uh, the second point was communication. Um, I think when 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 we look at uh, pictures like uh, those you 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 show us, um, for me, the, 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 one of the first question uh, was how how did they circulate in society? How do they circulate between? communities, uh, interpretive communities, uh, men and women in society. So this these two points uh, are very interesting for me. Uh, how memory uh, does matter and how uh, uh, communication matters in this history of emotions. Thank you. Those are great points, both of them, and I will then, um, I'll try and say something about both of them. Um, 
Memory is hugely important, yes. And um, obviously collective memory and the way that memory is passed down through generations. And I think one of the things that history of emotions can help us see is how things change really quite slowly because of the power of, of that memory. Um, and we can ask ourselves about the way that um, change speeds up and slows down uh, uh, and the way that that is dependent on memory. So that I guess I'm talking about intergenerational memory and the way that um, those images and words are taught from one generation to the next and they're remembered but with change. So there's memory and change um, uh, at, at every at every stage. Um, there's also a, a longer sense of memory, I guess, in that our languages and cultures have within them all sorts of sort of cultural traces and sort of distant memories. So when I'm talking about passions being different and deadly sins being different and ire being different from anger, the fact I'm able to talk about those things, and I would be able to talk about those things with an audience that were not historians, um, shows that those, those things have not disappeared. They're in our language and they're in our collective memories still. So even the ability to kind of make historical points about what has changed requires those things to still be with us to some extent to be able to talk about them. So I think that sense of memory is important for historians of emotions as well. Um, but for me, I suppose the most important sense of memory is the one I said at the beginning of my answer. It's about um, memory within generations and across generations and how things change over time um, and why perhaps some things are remembered more than others. And I guess the thing that links your two, your two uh, questions, your two points of memory and communication, what links them is, is, I guess you might say, reproduction. It's words and images being reproduced. Um, and I guess to use a sort of evolutionary metaphor, you know, reproduced with changes, reproduced with modification. Um, and that uh, process goes on in both memory across time um, and in reproduction across a culture. So, and that's absolutely fundamental. So every classroom that I go into in England has got very similar imagery up on the wall um, about emotions. You know, a, a lot of, it's not, it's not identical. It's not identical, but it's similar. Um, and a lot of it is representations from the movie Inside Out of those cartoon characters. You know, these are your emotions. But there's also, there's lots of other books that are a bit like that, uh, which represent the emotions with very primary colors. Um, and so that the reason I'm mentioning that is that's how children learn are learning at school what emotions are and what they look like and what to call them. And so that is mass reproduction of a movie. It's one movie, but that movie is not the only thing of a way of representing a very reductive way of representing emotions, which has taken over um, a lot of cultural space. Um, now the equivalent in the uh, 16th, 17th centuries is the same process is going on, but it is much less obviously uh, mass produced and it's much less global. Um, it's much more local. However, and I'm not an art historian, as I'm sure will have been perfectly clear <laughs> from, uh, from my comments, um, the, the job of art historians and cultural historians is to really get to grips with those reproductions in the 16th, 17th century. And very often you can show that there are, as I tried to uh, in a, a very brief way today, that there are patterns, even though they're not uh, reproduced on a mass or global scale, there are patterns such as the image of ira as a deadly sin, which involves male violence and sometimes involves drunkenness. Um, quite simple but kind of moralistic imagery that is reproduced with changes quite widely. Uh, and again, I'm not particularly well qualified to answer your question about how did men and women come across this imagery, but the obvious first answer is in church, painted on the walls, um, or through the, the uh, stage, you know, the, the um, what's it called, the stages of the, the passion, you know, following the... Um, Oh, what's it called? I can't the phrase for at Easter when you follow the 
it's just gone out of my mind but you know that the imagery of the passion of christ the crucifixion the emotions of the virgin mary via, via crucis exactly um and that's just one way in which um men and women would encounter stories words and simple imagery uh, which would give them the frameworks that we're talking about um and his meditation in the medieval period, for example. So Sarah McNamer has the, a book called Affective Meditation. And I'm sure many other historians have written about the words and images and how they were used in the context of worship and in the context of ritual and of the religious practice of the time. So that's that's a, a couple of attempts at an answer. But do come back and tell me, you know, what you would like to see more of or what you would like to say about it. I have a curiosity. In one of your podcasts, you were uh, just uh, quoting, and actually it was intervening a theorist. She was a scientist uh, um, who believed in basic emotions. And she said that she has never experienced anger in her life. And I found it very <laughs> inspiring and interesting. So can you tell us something about that? But I was I'm also interested in knowing your position about new neurosciences. Uh, what's your position about it and how do, do you, you know, dialogue with it? Thank you. Well, neuroscience is a bit like the Bible. You can almost always find someone saying what you want, you know, to back up your, uh, your moral or your view of reality. Uh, so neuroscience is no problem. I mean, and that's a slightly flippant answer, but neuroscience is a very broad church and um, there, there's a lot of basic emotion theorists in neuroscience. So it's easy for me to come and speak to historians and say, oh, the Paul Ekman theory is very simplistic and it's been debunked. But there's plenty of people who, it may not, maybe not Paul Ekman, but who think that some version of that theory is quite robust. And, and Sarah Garfinkel is the, the scientist you were talking about who, who was standing up for some version of basic emotions theory. Um, but, but, but there are lots of different approaches to, to science and to neuroscience of emotion. Um, that same podcast series, there's a whole episode, which is just me talking with Jim Russell. So Jim Russell is a psychologist of emotion who, who is like the main alternative school of science of emotion. There's Jim Russell and there's Lisa Feldman Barrett. And those two are the big American leaders of this, um, psychological construction view of emotion which is i could explain a bit more but maybe not be necessary but that's a good like, alternative scientific theory so those of us who want to resist basic emotions we can have good scientific reasons for doing so we can have have good friends in science who, who can help us with that and i have found actually so this summer i spoke at the society for effective sciences for the first time um and there's, you know, there's lots of interest among scientists in the history of emotions as well and in the philosophy of emotions. And there's, re there's real scope for very good interdisciplinary conversations. Um, you you qu questioned about Sarah Garfinkel, who said she doesn't experience anger. Um, she actually, and, and that is obviously amazing to say, I believe in basic emotions, but I've never really experienced one of them. Um, we had a public event um, to launch the podcast. And to be fair to her, at that event, she said that she has slightly changed her mind since giving that interview, that she thinks that maybe some of the feelings she's had in the past are a bit more like anger than she realized. Um, but certainly her experience and other people's experience opens up the fact that even if we all use the word anger, we mean quite different things by it. Uh, um, and so that to me in itself is, is, is quite strong evidence against there being universal emotions, just the sheer difficulty of understanding what you or I mean by anger, let alone everybody. There is a question from Alessandro Arcangeli, you can go ahead. Sure, um, thanks. Um, so, uh, Thomas, from the way you described the the um, the, the, the posters at the schools and the, the the way they work, uh, the, the, they use the, the film and everything, uh, it, it looks to me 
as if uh, the basic emotion theory, uh, rather than by uh, nature, is kind of winning by nurture. So is is used to uh, impress to kids. Uh, uh, presumably, teachers do it uh, with very good uh, spirit, with the idea of uh, uh, um, promoting self knowledge. But they are actually doing it uh, in a way in which a standardized and potentially a poor, limiting view of of self. Uh, is kind of wins uh, and you you battle against this, but uh, I don't know how how you, uh, your your work works. I don't know if you're called by 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 teachers. Or you have had any systematicity in you know going around, uh, but uh, uh, I'll be curious to know uh, how you perceive uh, that what is going on at, at the school level at the time. Thank you very much, and thanks for asking more about the schools because um, I find that very interesting. I hundred percent agree with you. Yes, the theory of basic emotions is is being reproduced through culture. It's it's being reproduced culturally through nurture. Um, I guess I yeah, I mean, I don't think it has no relation, of course, to to, to the brain and the body. I, I don't think that the human beings can have an absolutely infinite variety of feelings that are just utterly different from each other. But I, yes, that. Paul Ekman, Five Basic Emotions Inside Out, is very limiting and um, very impoverished. The thing I would say um, about my experience so far with schools is I, I, have, um, I have had some uh, success at, a, I've, I've created a whole series of lessons, which is based precisely on the aim of producing for children material about the history of art, philosophy, science, uh, the history of ideas, the English language, um, the history of the English language in Greek and Latin, which will give them a much richer picture of passions and emotions um, and which will improve their emotional vocabulary. And there's a, there's a great appetite for that. And I've worked with quite a lot of schools who've used these lessons and taught these lessons to hundreds of children and we have studied the effects. It's quite small scale, a few hundred children, and it's massively improved their emotional vocabulary, and we've had lots of positive feedback. I'm not in the position to do that for every school in England, and uh, I, I'm not really qualified to, and it would be, to, and also I'm not really in favour of rolling out a, a, a set of lessons across every school in England, and that's kind of against the whole point. I mean, what I'm in favour of is, 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 is a much more local and a much more contextual approach, and depending what children are at your school, it, the visual and verbal imagery that is most useful will, will vary. Um, I, I continue to work in this area and I hope I'll do more work with more schools in due course. Um, also, I'm making a podcast right now um, about this topic. And that's one of the reasons I've been visiting schools is to see what they do. I think the my feelings about it are relatively optimistic. Um, I mean, I ended my talk by saying, let's teach children more about emojis. Um, children are... are endlessly obviously curious and creative and so I, I'm not worried about their understanding of life being permanently harmed by them being taught the theory of basic emotions. Um, I'm also relatively optimistic because most teachers in most schools as the children get older will teach them more interesting versions of it and they'll teach them five or six different words for fury, resentment, being irate and so on. Um, so teachers instinctively are trying to broaden it out um, already. Um, and certainly some schools are doing a really, really good job of, of trying to think about this. For me, the, the, twin, the twin challenges, the two big challenges in, for young people in schools uh, is firstly getting beyond basic emotions, but secondly, trying to steer away from psychiatry and medicine for as long and as much as possible. Uh, obviously, there are children and young people with serious problems that need very expert psychiatric, medical, behavioral help. But a lot of them have strong feelings that are not pathological. Um, and so a big part of my motivation is to give them the language and the understanding that strong feelings are, I mean, indeed, as Sano and Monmouth understood, strong passions are universal. 
I want to be careful what I say here. I don't want to get too sweeping, but I, 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 I'm keen that children should have an understanding that this is normal. It's not an illness. So that's another one big part of my I mean, you could say it's normal and it is an illness. I mean, if you go back to the early modern sources, passions are diseases. They're diseases that everybody has. And actually, one thing I've been thinking recently is that the mental illness is now becoming so universal. Maybe we're somehow going back to a weird version of that where everyone is sick, which is a, not a strange thing to say if you're a Stoic or a Christian theologian. Um, but now mental health and mental illness are becoming such universal reference points that maybe we're getting to a new version of everyone being sick. Particularly in the, in the pandemics. <laughs> Thank you very oh, well, much. I mean, that's yes, that's different. That's different. May I? Uh, yes, I have a, a curiosity about another element uh, that is not words, not images, but sounds. Uh, I don't know if you worked <laughs> about this, uh, around this also, but uh, sounds are, and music are uh, linked in, uh, in many ways to emotions. And so um, uh, what do you think about this? Or <laughs> there are studies about this or <laughs> yeah, historical, yeah, yeah. historical, absolutely. yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm not sure whether... Um, it's the same in all calendars of all countries. But today in England is St. Cecilia's Day, uh, which is, who is the, the, the patron saint of music. Um, oh. So it's, it's a good day to be asking about yeah, music okay. uh, and emotions. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I mean, just on a completely personal note, the reason that I got interested in emotions as a young person was because of music. Um, it was the mystery, and it remains a pretty much a mystery to me, you know, of how listening to an orchestra playing can make my body and mind do these extraordinary things and feel these, these things. And that's, I'm quite happy for that to remain a mystery. I mean, I find studying things that you love too much can be a, can be a, a mistake. Um, so on a personal level, 100%, of course, music is, is one of the most amazingly powerful things. Things that through which we feel emotions, we learn emotions, we express emotions, um, and that's what. Well, yeah, and that is a great topic of historical study as well. Um, the, the people have studied. It's easier to study ideas about, as it always is. You know, ideas about music and emotions, and you know, the and, theory. And even patterns, patterns of emotions, or I don't know. Well, yes, I mean, with, within the musical theory, yeah. this is not my this is not my field, but. Um, mm -hmm. That there is, um, if you, I'm afraid in the heat of the moment, I can't remember the names of the people who I want to recommend that you read. But if you drop me an email, I could send you some, yes. some recommendations of historians who have looked at the theoretical link of emotions and music yeah. in, different, in different periods and what was believed about, you know, why does a particular type of music sound like joy or sadness and so on? And, and people oh, have. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That. I mean, but broadening that out, I would also say that. One of, the, one of the types of history that the history of emotions comes out of and overlaps with is the history of the senses. Um, and one, but only one, part of what historians of emotions are doing, it seems to me, and maybe this is the least important, I don't know, but is kind of giving the past a, a sort of pulse and a body and senses. And, you know, to ask a question... Like what did it smell like? You know, there are historians of smell as well. You know, what, what did it smell like in a particular time and place? What did it sound like? That gets you into emotions very quickly. You know, what did it sound and smell like to be in a bomb shelter under your house in London in 1941? You know, what did it smell like to be a plague doctor? I don't know. Um, the senses, sound and touch and taste and smell, um, a very rich ground. Again, it's not my field, but that all of those things have their own histor historians, as I'm sure you know. And um, it seems to me are a very good way at getting at the broader history of experience and emotion. So all I can say is I agree. And there's lots to be said about that. And some people have done it more than I have. I have not. I mean, I'm tends to be, uh, my starting point tends to be words and I kind of broaden out to images. I've not myself got into researching sounds and smells and tastes but it's a brilliant uh, area for research hello may i i i, I think so okay um 
and yeah, uh, hello everyone. And I was uh, wondering if I may ask something about again age groups. So uh, when you showed us the poster for the Pixar movie, um, what I thought about was that uh, not only that poster was uh, on made for children, but also for more adults people. So you know the '60s stylings of the lettering. And also the 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 squared head of the of the angry character, which is clearly kind of a yeah a, a, a worker a Thai worker, and is also recalling the uh, the movie character from the nineteen ninety two movie uh, Falling Down. So it's something that obviously uh, will cater more to adults and not children. And so I was yeah willing to ask if you could find this kind of uh double relation to a double public also in way back in in the past representation of passions and emotions yeah that's a great question and i really i really love your observations uh, about inside out that's that's really i'm i'm sure that's true i mean i watched it with my children i do think it's quite a good film actually um I'm not I'm not anti inside out. Um and I yeah, those are really interesting observations about about the way it appeals to adults and how it's about uh to falling down and other things. Um now, do do the same things happen in the past? Well, I think it's fairly easy to see that the same. I know this isn't your question. But bear with me. Um, you know, similar messages about the passions are, are, are being put out to children and to adults. I mean, it's only in relatively modern times that you can find sources aimed at children. You know, uh, I guess from the well, I wouldn't like to say exactly, but 18th, 19th century onwards, um, you can find children's stories, children's hymns, children's poetry, children's songs, children's books. You know, um, so once that starts happening, then I guess almost. But, almost by definition, those things are going to be aimed at adults as well, because adults are going to be the teachers, the governesses, the parents, the, the, the priests, the educators, the ones who bring the children to the books um, and to the images. So um, it's not a question I've ever addressed my mind to. I think it's a great question. I think you would be able to show that that was happening. The, the, other, the other thing that comes to mind for me, just for sources that I've looked at, is something like Charles Dickens, sort of sentimental very, very popular Victorian novels and stories, which were kind of aimed at the whole family. You might expect the family to sit down together and read read aloud or consume those stories together. Um, and that's an example, I think, where you, you would see, and also um, church, you know, and, and, and Bible reading, family prayers, um, church services. Again, that would be aimed at a whole family, including children. Um, and adults. So those are my immediate thoughts. I think it's a very good question. Do you want to come back on that? Uh, no, I mean, it's yeah, it's a really nice answer, I would say. I was just curious because I'm really far from the history of emotion, but a bit more into cartoon and children literature. So I was wondering what you said, but uh, absolutely. Thank you. And I leave space to other people to talk. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the first thing that came to mind when you asked the question, apart from Charles Dickens, was that there's, um, there's someone called Isaac Watts, who's an 18th century English writer, and he, he writes very, very popular hymns, hymns, songs, and poems, some of which are aimed at children, and which are quite, well, to us modern snowflakes, you know, quite terrifying uh, about what's going to happen to them if they're not good. <laughs> Um, but the reason I mentioned him is that he also wrote a, a philosophical treatise on the passions. And you can find similar messages in both types of writing, obviously framed in different ways for children um, and for philosophers, but similar messages about the passions, you know, the, the, the danger of the passions, uh, the power of the passions. So he's an example where he's producing different kind of content, but that he would expect people to be able to look at together, I think. If no one else has a question, I'd like to go back to the idea of the face expression in the India, Indian, uh, what's the Rasa theory. I'm curious about it. 
Sorry, I was muted there. Yes. If I may, I'll share my screen because I can then just show you a couple of images and talk talk about it because I, I kind of I got it hurried over that. And that was a moment when my face was blocking the text and I got in a bit of a panic. Um, so let me go back to the, the PowerPoint. Is that right? Let me try that. Yeah. So many slides. Okay. Okay. So this is the angry young man, and um, the Raza theory. So if if you, if you ever come across people talking about Indian traditions of representation of emotion, you very often will get quickly into Raza theory. Now, of course, I'm not an expert on this either, but I've read quite a lot about it. Um, it's an ancient tradition. There's a foundational Sanskrit text called the Natya Sastra or the Treatise on Drama, written in the early centuries of the Common Era. So it's about two thousand years old in that form. The Raza is the emotional tone that is created by the work of art. I've put it in capital letters, not equivalent to basic emotion theory. Raza literally means juice or essence or taste. The facial expression is part of Raza theory, but, um, and I'll go on and show you the pictures in just a second. But yeah, the, the, the under, as far as I got with understanding it is, the Raza is like a, a taste or a flavor. And I really kind of, I really like this idea as one to bring into conversation with our other ways of understanding emotions. Um, because I think it captures something about when we sense the atmosphere in a room or we uh, sense the kind of essence or, or smell or flavor metaphorically of an interaction or a person's attitude to us. And I think it's a way, it's a much more realistic way of thinking about emotions than, you know, I don't go into the kitchen and look at my wife's face and study what it's showing in terms to find out how she's feeling, you know. Um, that's not what we do most of the time in, in, in life, although the face, of course, is powerful and important. Okay, so Raza, that's Raza. And it's a, it starts off as a theory of drama, performance, and aesthetics. It comes out of aesthetics. Now, the reason for showing the actual images, and this is why I have a problem again with um, trying to see what it says, um, is that, so some people do try to make this identification between Raza and basic emotions. Um, and when they do that, there's something called the Raudra Raza, which is often translated as anger. Um, but these images here show one version of the facial expression for the Raudra Raza. And certainly to my eyes, that doesn't look like anger at all. The one on the left looks more like something I would call surprise, and the one on the right looks like disgust um, or aversion or, or something like that. Um, so this is just to reinforce that whatever Raza theory is, it is not the theory of basic emotions. Um, there is more to Raza than just facial expression, but even if you do try and reduce it to stereotype facial expressions, which some people do, it doesn't map on neatly to Western basic emotions, which is what you would expect. But then just to say again, a point I already made, what's interesting in the angry young man is you get the coming together of these different traditions. And that's one thing that I think is interesting, the possibility of combining visual and verbal elements of different traditions to create a new sort of emotional style or emotional concept as uh, Imka Rajamani calls it. The downside of, of giving such a, a sweeping presentation is that I have to keep on saying I'm not an expert on quite a lot of it. If you want to talk about um, Christian theology, I'm, I'm, I'm confident on that. Um, <laughs> and the history of ideas in the English language, I can do that as well. So thank you. Uh, is my microphone on? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. Time is running up. Uh, we are pretty finished our uh, scheduled time. So uh, if there are uh, any questions, we will just close our session and uh, just, uh, and I, I want just to, to, to thank uh, Thomas Dixon for being here and uh, to the other, uh, all, all the participants to this, uh, I think, a very interesting uh, seminar and very interesting uh, um, debate. And uh, um, just to remind you that uh, uh, these uh, uh, Cultural History Mondays 
continues uh, with the last uh, session on uh, uh, six on the sixth of December in, in two weeks with Linda Colley, which uh, uh, will uh, will uh, will do a, a seminar on uh, uh, with the title. Uh, what happens when the, uh, a written constitution is printed, uh, is print, excuse me. Uh, and I think that uh, the problem of emotion linked to some practical issues uh, such constitutionism uh, will be uh, for us another uh, way of, of uh, continuing this um, debate about emotions. So thank you very much, Thomas. And thank you, everybody. And uh, see you uh, see you soon here. Or uh, we we wish <laughs> not only virtually another world time. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Very much. Thanks for thank all your you. questions. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.